Um, welcome back to the afternoon committee meeting of the Vermont House Human Services Committee on um, Tuesday, March 22nd. Uh, this is, <clears throat> we've just had a very successful floor. Um, congratulations to the reach up team. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh. Yay! Um, yeah. Unanimous, unanimous <laughs> um, support. That's great. Um, we have one last. Um, bill that we have been working on that is on the calendar uh, for action on Thursday. We are taking testimony tomorrow morning, some additional testimony from docs tomorrow morning um, around whether it's pre-authorization, um, whether it's a study. We're trying to understand more about it and what we can do. Um, what we can do this year, is dependent upon the fact that by end of the day on Wednesday, if we have an amendment to the bill, it needs to be on the calendar for reporting on Thursday. And um, so that is where we are in terms of that. Um, some people, people are beginning to um, read the bill and expressing some um, interest in it. Um, and so we're working with other members of the um, House. Um, Representative Donahue's um, looked at it and wondered whether things need definitions or not. Um, um, but uh, what I really wanted to do with us right now is um, Dane had um, come on in. I'm sure who are you? Good. Have some. Uh, come, come on in and join join our um, <laughs> our committee meeting, um, Representative Peter Peter Fagan. And if you want, you can sit at a chair. That smells really good. Um, uh, we are on Zoom. Um, if we if you want someone or if you'd like to join us, you could sit in that in in, in the witness chair, or you could sit in Kelly's chair. I do appreciate that, Madam Chair. I was really just hoping to borrow. Representative Whitman for about three to five minutes, just for some clarifying questions. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we are still up for. Um, but I could also wait a little while because I will be downstairs and he could join me when he's capable. Would that be possible? Because he was about to um, <laughs> uh, clarify some things for us. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. My mother. Got to try that then, if you don't mind. <laughs> you know, may I? Yes. I'm Mikey. Get Mikey to eat it. He'll try anything that kind of thing. <laughs> 335 calories. Mm. <laughs> Less than no, six. Really <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh, please. I can have my daily. Okay, thank you. Sorry. My compliments come on. Very good. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Shepard. So, yeah. um, folks, I believe that um, the amendment that um, Dane worked on um, with Legislative Council is now on uh, our webpage. I also do see that um, Legislative Council is, is with us. Um, and my question to you, um, Representative Whitman, um, is should we go over the amendment and would you like a, a Legislative Council to do that for us? I, uh, I believe that Legislative Council would be very good at doing that. Okay. So I really appreciate it. Katie <laughs> would be able to do so. Okay. Um, so um, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Katie. Um, if you could walk us through, it's um, up on our webpage. And um, part of me is just trying to bring the committee together in terms of where we are. Okay. Good afternoon. Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Council. Let me make sure let me pull up the document for myself okay um so we are looking at language if you remember maybe i'll take a few steps back um the bill that passed out of committee had um four sections dealing with prior authorization for mat and house appropriations was it house appropriations remove that language um and so now we have some unnumbered sections in the bill that would just appear as deleted sections. 
So this amendment is instances of amendment. And the first instance is adding um, new sections three and four to fill in two of those deleted spaces that would be left by the House Appropriations Amendment. Um, so first, there is language in section three um, that reads in subsection A, the A HS shall provide coverage to Medicaid beneficiaries for medically necessary MAT for opioid use disorder when prescribed by a healthcare professional practicing within the scope of the professional's license and participating in the Medicaid program. And secondly, upon approval of the Drug Utilization Review Board, the agency shall cover at least one medication in each therapeutic class for methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone as listed on Medicaid's preferred drug list without requiring prior authorization. And it's my understanding, although Representative Whitman will correct me if I'm wrong, that this sort of codifies the existing practice of how um, DIVA maintains prior authorizations for these drugs. And then, oops, did I interrupt somebody? Um, 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 Katie, I would. Um as a Katie, um, Dane and Taylor and I met with, oh, and um, Jen met to sort of talk about these things. I mean, and to get sort of clarity. And uh, it was our understanding, but maybe we need to clarify that, that um, this is, just, this is codifying what is in rule. That this does not change what they are doing right now, um, but it codifies it in rule. I mean, in statute. Which, which portion? This what what Katie just referenced. Okay. Section three. Okay. Section this three of the bill. Right here. The part that Medicaid. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Then moving on to section four. This is a report back. Um, so that's sort of happening in two parts in subsection A, we're having um, the Drug Utilization Review Board um, collect certain data and submit its findings and recommendations to DIVA. And then in subsection B, DIVA is reporting to the General Assembly. Usually the Drug Utilization Review Board doesn't report directly to um, the General Assembly. That's why there's this intermediary step. So in subsection A, by December 1st of this year, the Drug Utilization Review Board shall review the following and submit its findings and recommendations to DIVA. So it will look into the quantity limits and preferred medications for buprenorphine products, the feasibility and costs associated with adding monobuprenorphine products as preferred medications, and lastly, how other states' Medicaid programs address prior authorization for MAT, including the 60-day deferral or prior authorization implemented by Oregon's um, Medicaid program. So looking at what other states do, including this very specific ask about what Oregon does. Um, and then again, subsection B, step two of this is that by January 15th of 2023, DIVA is to submit a written report containing all of the information in subsection A um, to the two committees of jurisdiction. And then in your underlining bill, um, the bill is introduced because it was a committee bill. You had a section seven that had um, a report section on prior authorization for MAT with regard to Medicaid. So this amendment strikes out that whole section and then it basically puts the whole section back in without many changes. Um, but because there were a few changes here and there, it was maybe easier to see as a strike through than as inserting a word here and after this line and after this line. So um, just to refresh your memory, this is a series of three annual reports from DIVA to the committees of jurisdiction regarding uh, prior authorization processes for MAT in Vermont's Medicaid program during the previous calendar year. So first, which medications required prior authorization? That was in um, your original version. Subdivision two is new, the reason for initiating prior authorization. And subdivision three, how many prior authorization requests the department received and of these, 
how many were approved and denied and the reason for approval and denial. So this latter half of the language, the reason for approval and denial is new. And then lastly, the average and longest length of time the department took to process a prior authorization request. And that is it. Thank you. Thank you for that walkthrough, Katie. Um, I, I need to go and turn this over um, to Teresa. Perhaps it will be quick. It's supposed to be a quick check-in. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah. um, Taylor and Dane may have some updates. And we are starting at 9.15. What time are we starting tomorrow? Nine. Nine. Starting tomorrow at nine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just in case I don't get that. Right. You know that you don't have to. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be sure you didn't lose it. No, no, I didn't. Okay. Um, thank you, Katie, for that review. Um, Christina Whitman, oh, well, I guess it's just us, right? So, um, <laughs> Uh, Taylor and Dane, um, any thoughts about how you came to this and uh, where we might be further headed? Yeah, absolutely. I'll take a shot at it. And uh, thank you again, Katie, uh, for walking through all that. I think that's an excellent sort of introduction. And uh, yeah, I think the best way to sort of describe how we came to this, and Taylor, feel free to uh, jump in if you have another idea, but really, um, in collaborating with the department, uh, DIVA, on scene, where they sort of saw a path forward to address some of these issues that we agree where we want to um, make treatment as accessible as possible, right? So I think that um, really the first page of uh, this um, amendment that you see was uh, proposed by DIVA, um, essentially saying, let's use the existing process in place through the Drug Utilization Review Board to sort of review our current practices um, and revise as necessary based on um, the latest and greatest information that we've been collecting and the, um, everything that we've been bringing uh, to this topic. Um, I would say that section four on page two um, was really uh, with, uh, Taylor and I working together, trying to make that sort of process a little bit more direct and specific mm -hmm. as far as what did we want to hear back from uh, through that review process and when did we want to hear back about it and what exact specific components did we want them to consider and report back on. Um, so you'll see um, one, two, three uh, on page two lines six through 12, um, you know, we want them to consider the quantity limits. Um, we want them to consider uh, mono buprenorphine and where that fits into the picture. Um, I'm interested in hearing from the committee after the testimony we received today, um, if we have any updated thinking about how to uh, best uh, phrase, uh, how do we want, to, what do we want them to consider in light of the monobuprenorphine product, right? Um, part, when you say consider, it says feasibility and cost. Yeah. Are, are we talking about feasibility and cost still requiring prior authorization or is this feasibility and cost with uh, relaxing prior authorization? Relaxing prior authorization. Okay, so I, I, I would suggest that I think that could be a little more specific. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, if I may interject on just that one, uh, the preferred medications do not have prior authorizations except for dose. I see. Okay, so that's inferred. Um, I would say so, but I look to Dane. Um, I think that if we could be more uh, specific, that uh, so you're essentially saying that. Well, I'm just. I, I know that perhaps now that things are on the preferred list don't have. A prior authorization requirement, um, but I'm just, I, I guess I would wonder. Um, it explicit. Right. I would, it, I would just wonder, given the at least current opinion that we should, you know, should not do this, at least from Diva's perspective. 
Um, I guess I just would, I think it would yeah. be better served to so, be explicit uh, about that. I think, I think in general, um, one way to look at this feedback, Teresa, is for section four. Yeah. Um, submitted finding and recommendations re shall review the following and submitted finding and recommendations. Mm -hmm. I think um, we need to really spell it out that we're talking about um, prior authorization here, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, that's this not exactly with regard to in, in, the, yeah. in the language as is. And I think that um, as we look at things like quantity limits, um, we're talking about what's the limit at which prior authorization is triggered, right? Um, uh, I would kind of just do a minor correction, uh, Taylor, um, like to say that a preferred medication doesn't have prior authorization may not be completely um, accurate since we saw, for example, Suboxone is a preferred medication, but there's a large number of prior authorizations still taking place. So I think that this is sort of what we're asking them to come back to us is where can they relieve prior authorization pressures, what's the feasibility of that, what's the cost implications of that, and what are the, I think, clinical implications, but I think that's sort of captured within feasibility as well. And um, so, do, oh, that oh, was wow. quick. <laughs> so, um, Wrong guy. I guess just to be devil's advocate a little bit in that sort of that introductory um, thing on 4A, um, so I, I get where you're going with that. Um, and I think it's, it's actually a necessary thing because I think they could come back and say, well, the quantity limits and preferred medication for buprenorphine products with regard to prior authorization. Well, we already said, you know, mm -hmm. we don't require prior authorization for, you know, this X product. So um, I, I, I think that clarification actually would be beneficial in that, in that lead in paragraph. Great. And I think just building on that and, and rereading this, um, the, the feasibility and costs, well, the feasibility and costs uh, would, we know the cost right now. The department has said it's going to be $4 million if we ask them to add a, a monobuprenorphine um, into, because it's not a preferred uh, drug <clears throat> medication right now. But the question is whether or not they're willing to negotiate in those supplemental rebate discussions that they have on an annual basis about adding a monobuprenorphine product in as a preferred medication. And it's, and you know, to me, I mean, listening to, to Dr. Lord this morning, it's just as much about, even if they said, well, we need to maintain a prior authorization process, how that process works um, and, and what prescribers need to go through in order to get something prior authorized. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, I think they could still sort of meet the letter of their contracts with these drug yeah. producers, these, right, <laughs> um, by, by figuring out some way to, to um, honor the expertise and the knowledge of the prescriber with regard to the patient that they're seeing right in front of them. You know, that, that was the part that sort of struck me about the comparison between, you know, what they had to go through in order to get this alternative medication, you know, when, you know, compared to some of the other, you know, uh, more, you know, maybe more common, although this is pretty common, <laughs> this is a pretty common issue, but um, they, uh, it just, it, the common, it doesn't meet the common sense test. Mm -hmm. but, I mean, the straight, you know, we often kind of talk about the straight face test. It doesn't meet the straight face test. And so, how do you modify it? And I think that uh, I appreciate the work you're doing on this to, to sort of like work with Diva to say, okay, you know, and I did hear from them that, you know, if there's barriers that we can remove, we, we would like to remove them. Uh, this kind of gives them an opportunity, let's just say. Yeah, to remove what? I'm sorry. But... Barriers. Okay. I said, okay. I heard them say that if there are barriers, and I'm not sure we have convinced them that there are barriers, but um, I, I think, uh, uh, so anyways, I don't need to belabor that. I appreciate that. I think Dr. Lord did a great job today. I thought, I thought, I hope, I'm, 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 I'm sure that he was listening. Short of an act of Congress yes. to be able to. Uh, Could you get him on the review board? <laughs> well, I think that's, it, that lies in rules. That lies in rules for the department of saying, this is how you're going to navigate. You're going to try all these other drug combinations first. Um, and I doubt Diva, would like us to put that into 
statute. Yes. yes. Um, but how are we encouraging them to improve their systems now that they're listening to their providers saying that there are there are difficulties? And it seems like there's also a lot of review processes outside of DIVA and outside of Medicaid that are really watching prescribers when it comes to monobuprenorphine treatment. So where is that, that balance in, in trusting our providers? So I realized I came, I left and came back. Um, is there any... Is there any support or any worthwhileness of somehow doing, encouraging them to, to, to work on their internal processes so that you don't have to go through that, go through. that extra process that Dr. Lord was describing? Right. I wanted to ask the committee if on page two of this amendment, where we have number two. Um, the feasibility and the cost associated with adding monobuprenorphine products. Maybe we want to build off of that too to specify this issue that we're talking about. So not not only if if uh, if uh, added as a preferred medication and or uh, review this process for needing to verify um, adverse effects. Um, so maybe we could add some language along those lines as far as what we hope them to report back on. Review to make it, well, why don't we not have them report back? Why don't we ask them to review their current processes around that? <clears throat> what about the wording changes that Teresa had suggested? Are we going to consider that? Yeah. Um, we were just talking about at, you know, on page, uh, on section four, the beginning of page two at the top. Um, so it's not clear. It wasn't clear to me. And uh, I mean, I was inferring it, but I, I think it is good to spell it out that uh, uh, four, A, one, two, and three are really all about the prior authorization process. So, um, so it seemed like the quantity limits and the feasibility and costs associated with well, you know, they could list anything, you know, with regard to that. What we're really interested in are those things as it relates to removing or modifying the prior authorization process. Okay. And so we need lead in language in, in 4A that connects it back to the prior okay. authorization process. <clears throat> I think that would be important. Yeah. yeah. Um, Julie, um, have we formally invited Diva? for tomorrow. Oops. Um, can we formally invite the um, diva? <clears throat> and and if, um, if they can't dedicate their whole morning, the latter half would probably be better because that's when we'll be discussing language and wording. But... Um, <clears throat> so I think we're on page two of the three page uh, amendment. And yeah, is there, are there any other questions? Um, we figured that it would be great to um, submit findings and recommendations for a 60 day deferral period. That was one of the proposals that we initially included. Um, Oregon has done this and apparently they have made it work so that it doesn't uh, uh, breach their sort of contracts around preferred medications. So if we could learn more about the uh, logistics of that um, and the feasibility of that. Um, and then, yeah, basically that we'll get a report back. Um, so are there any other questions for this page before we move on to the reporting? Just, if you could just uh, refresh my memory on what was, like when we asked the question, if we removed prior authorization, what would the cost implication be? And what was that number? If we were to, and it was actually specifically based on uh, what we sort of post and all of those different right. levels and indefinitely, you know, not for a given time period, there's a lot of intersection and overlap. They based on um, the fact that it would have been in breach of their contract with um, their preferred medications, that would have been $4 million. And then they estimated based on the uptake of the most, um, you know, costly medication available. It's sort of this assumption that people would be able to freely transition. Uh, they'd be able to choose the medication that they want <laughs> and that it would be a more costly medication. 
um, that brought their full estimate up to 17 million, up to 35 million for that. And I think that what we're looking at in this case is first 60 days, um, seeing that that may be the most critical time for somebody engaging in treatment uh, for the first time. How can we remove a potential barrier so that they don't need to go through uh, some of the processes of jumping through hoops, using medications that are uh, that they may have adverse reactions to, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's the number, though, or some adaptation of that. That when we're talking about here, the feasibility and costs associated with okay, is that that's a portion of it? Correct. But does that lower it or? Um, I would say increase it. Okay. So for number two. I would say that that's a very specific medication. Uh, right. Taylor, Taylor, do you want to take a shot at this? Yes, I would love to. Um, so feasibility and cost, we know what the feasibility and cost is if we were to put this into statute today, where we say you have to include monobuprenorphine, it would be $4 million. Mm -hmm. They do an annual negotiation with the distributors on those medication rebates. Um, and so they can renegotiate terms with those distributors so that maybe there's not a rebate, but there wouldn't be a cost implication of having the monobuprenorphine. That would have to be a discussion with the distributors themselves to discuss rebates, but we're trying to encourage um, that push them to have that conversation so that we don't have a $4 million impact and are able to reduce barriers. And I think what we heard today is that maybe the prior authorizations for monobuprenorphine are not the specific issue, but it's all the other hurdles before the prior authorization sure. that are challenging. Well, it sounded like to me that Dr. Lord was concerned with the fact that his uh, Description, you know, that he's the expert in this area, mm -hmm. and that somebody else was going to have to go ahead and okay his prescription. Right. So, is there a way to? I mean, the two doctors we heard from are experts in their area. Are there others that are prescribing these medications that may not fall into that category, but are working for some? You know, in other words, could we uh, carve out those real experts and say you don't need prior authorization because these guys? said what it was okay and and i'll look to dane on this one around the preferred provider network is that is that in that realm uh i i would i think that looking at a specific carve out as far as whether um i mean i think a lot of spoke providers um may be uh you know, everybody receives their, their same level of training through SAMHSA, right? And I don't know um, if you're suggesting that we say that it needs to be signed off by um, an MD instead of a nurse practitioner. Mm -hmm. um, is that what you're suggesting? Or um, is it? I, I mean, Carl, what I'm hearing you say is, I mean, these are two, folk, these are two doctors who work within the, the, the Medicaid blueprint hub and spoke system. And so by virtue of that may have more of an expertise than a physician who is um, doing, you know, it's operating under. I guess that's what it, where I was coming from. And so that kind of thing. And James, we're, we're not ignoring you. And that, yeah, sorry. No, 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 I'm just letting him know I'm we're not ignoring you. my questions. So oh, yeah, don't worry. Anyone. No, I'm done that, that question. Um, James. Well, I kind of it's kind of kind of what Carl was getting started on. I'm not sure. So when when uh, the doctor said this morning about their expertise not being questioned, my first thing obviously was, of course, you're a doctor. But then I was, th I was thinking about it because, I, uh, contrary to what it may seem, I do a lot of thinking, and um, we got into this trouble because people who thought they were experts didn't question. Um, uh, the history of opioids really starts addiction. Mm -hmm. The biggest part is in the 80s and it goes into the 90s and 2000s and how it grew. And yeah, the, the pharmaceutical companies were sued and they, you know, obviously we have bills about this, right? Um, but they didn't get them to patients without experts in the middle called physicians that prescribed them to people and believed 
what they were being told, including in their education. So I don't, I don't think they're vicious people like, oh, I'm going to go do this. They didn't do that. They thought that they were experts. Um, and in most cases, case, cases, certainly no more than I do. Um, but when we're talking about this, we should never, this is not downgrading, but yeah, yeah. never just throw our hats in the, in the ring and go, well, this person has this degree or that degree or some other degree, or they've been doing this for 20 years and just say, okay, they must know. Because we got in a situation that we're in, and it's a pretty darn serious situation. Um, you know, and this, this open is such a big deal that, um, and I'm sure most of you, especially you guys know this, that um, our life expectancy in the country actually decreased several years ago for the first time ever, and it's because of overdoses and, and, and drug use. So um, my point is that we didn't get there because experts uh, said, well, hey, listen, you're, this isn't working, uh, and we're going to stop. They, they experts said, oh, this sounds right. We're going to keep on keep on doing it. And now we've had, had the chicken come home to roost or whatever. Is that the right thing? Chicken come home. And uh, I mess them up all the time. So... <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe we need to work on um, changing the process so it's not an act of Congress, but we also should be making sure we have some kind of um, trigger mechanism, fail to fail seat, whatever you want to call it, that says, hey, when you're moving to mono, especially since mono is the one that we've heard just two years ago in our bill, two or three years ago, whatever it is, um, in itself it is used as a drug. It is, and there's a country, I forget which one, because I made a whole big speech about it last time when we had our bill two years ago, um, that the entire drug epidemic in that country is the mom. So um, it is an issue, and it's becoming, as they said this morning, becoming more of an issue that that is the drug of choice. So we have to be careful that we're not just saying, and I'm not opposed to this, by the way, at all, hmm. but I'm just saying, just be careful when you're making your steps and just don't think it's all blanket. Yeah, yeah. no, I... I uh, Appreciate you bringing that up, uh, James. And I guess my question uh, to you would be um, to sort of to sort of be able to give a uh, professional uh, that has expertise some amount of license while also having the check. How do you feel about what Dr. Lord was suggesting as far as <laughs> if a patient's having an adverse reaction and the doctor believes that the mono product would serve them better that a doctor can sort of just write off self-attest this person's having an adverse reaction and not need to first prescribe them anti-nausea medication or first prescribe them because that does seem like a bit of a double standard i agree with when they have those those issues but maybe there should be some kind of follow-up that has it like a check where they go okay let's you know the person now has this they're being treated well, let's let's double check that you know because it's a huge issue. We got in a big issue. It's one of the biggest problems in the country. Uh, you know, so um, not to have any checks and just say, "Yeah, we'll take your word for it." We got here because of that. So, and I would say uh, the the check, as I heard from Doctor Lord today, I think the check is the dosing that they were saying that when you look at the research. Um, when prescribing uh, that 16 milligrams is a standard dose and that over 24 milligrams, they're showing higher risk of diversion or that it actually might not be the right prescription for the individual. So I'm wondering if that is the direction that we're going of following the research on this one and saying, if, if that medication isn't working, you have no prior authorization up to this 16 milligram mark. And as noted, I don't oppose this stuff. Right. I'm, saying, I'm just saying you, that is guess answering what? your question of where that check and balance is. What I'm saying is that the research also showed it was a great thing for chronic care. And now we know it's absolutely not a good thing for chronic care. Uh, and, you know, you shouldn't have been getting it for a full wisdom tooth. So, you know, opioids. Very true. So, I mean, I think. Anyway, I, I digress on my point, but I'm just saying, it's, you know, I didn't think I had it in me. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> Wait, you raise a really good point, but maybe that's why the DEA has X waivers for people to prescribe. Because you totally do raise a good point that anybody could prescribe mm -hmm. opioids, and that's how we got where we are. Mm -hmm. Not anyone can prescribe these particular mm -hmm. drugs. You have to go through a specific that this X waiver mm -hmm. through the, the Fed. So is that the check? I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. You definitely raise a good point. And uh, yeah. 
you know, and I don't know enough about how many patients you can have with an X-ray and how much you can prescribe. And is there a series of checks already in that particular certification that the doctors that are treating people with um, opioid use disorder need to have? So I don't know. And if I could just interject for one thing, Madam Chair, uh, I think that all of these are great considerations and there may come a time where we want to legislate some of these things. What's on the table right now is sending this to the Drug Utilization Review Board for their recommendations. So I have a couple of questions about yeah. the Drug Utilization Review Board. How often do they meet? Who's on it? And how often do they, did you already go through all that? No, but it's just what we've been asked about everything we do right now, you know, board. So, um, so um, uh, we, this is not a new board, right? This is not a new board. Um, so um, in order for us to even talk to someone in the next 12 hours, well, maybe it's 20, 18 hours. Um, we, we need to know who's the drug utilization board. Yeah. And what do they do? Yeah. And um, we need to, to be honest, we need to probably know it from not just reading about it. Okay. Are you are you suggesting a witness or yeah. yeah. Or someone on the phone. Can I get a witness? Um, I believe that. Uh, very good. I know that um, we heard in our uh, meeting that it's 50% physicians, 50% pharmacists. Um, and they mm -hmm. essentially uh, review at least every two years um, the changes in clinical guidelines, um, price of, prices of different drugs and things like that. That's just what we, um, from our working <laughs> group meetings with Diva, that's what we've heard back from them. So, so, so they, they do that already. Um, Did we already talk about some of these things belonged in, in the prior author, authorization camp? Yes, that's, okay. that's what we that's what we're talking about. Putting lead in language that essentially says that that's why. What do, I mean, I guess I, this is I'm I'm going to play appropriations. Why are we um, asking for a? Who are we asking? Are these two separate things? Correct. Mm -hmm. And why? I mean, sort of why are they two separate things? Um, uh, I mean, who's going to? And uh, I guess, are we changing? We probably don't want to change the um, function of the Drug Utilization Review Board. No, I, I think so. Whatever they do, if there's something that we can be specific with them and maybe consider moving some of these things with the Drug Utilization Review Board to DIVA doing a report where they may have to consult with them. I mean, I, you know, okay. it's, yeah. um, because I, I think one of the things I'm hearing some people also talk about is it's not, it's the process. And so how do we get them to review the process? And that's not the drug, I mean, since I don't know what the function of the drug utilization process um, review board is, if they're only saying certain drugs, yay, certain drugs, nay, then it would be the other to review that. That's, that's us playing nicely with others, mm -hmm. which is saying, okay, if you're gonna keep prior authorization, make it easier. Mm -hmm. Right. And we don't really say that in the second one. Well, we don't, we don't. If I may, the second report is a continuation of that report that we received and went through on prior authorizations, right. which was sunsetting this year. Mm -hmm. We got the last one this year. Oh, okay. and we're saying we want it to continue and, and we want to add. We want some additional information so just for clarity. Yes. Mm -hmm. It could be totally. Um, I just wanted to explain that that second one no, has already existed. Helpful. 
Uh, you know, yeah. I thought I had this straight now. I'm sure. <laughs> um, so I look at the first report is the, the, the sort of the experts on the drugs saying these are the ones that we think could change that, that we could recommend to Diva that has a change in process. That's that's what we're hoping comes out of it. And then I look at the second report as in addition to whatever you have here. Um, of saying not only what did we do, but how did we um, modify the process to be more accessible to prescribers? We don't ask them to do that, but should we be asking them to do that? Um, could you say that what sh should we maybe be asking them to do? Should we be asking Diva to, so take what is learned from the Drug Utilization Board, and should um, so if they come back and say X, Y, and Z drugs, we believe um, either don't need prior authorization anymore, or um, we believe they do still need prior authorization, but only under these circumstances. How do we address what Dr. Lord was talking about this morning, which was not the fact he wasn't really actually belaboring the fact that he had to get prior authorization. He was belaboring the fact that he was required to go through so many steps and they and they wouldn't acknowledge his um, as the prescribing physician. They wouldn't acknowledge his expertise of documenting that the patient had the adverse reaction yep. and instead had to go through all these ridiculous processes. And so I'm, that's the part that I, I feel like we don't get at in yeah. in either of this. I would I, re, I would recommend building that into the first report through the drug utilization review board, and then potentially uh, maybe adding something through through Diva administratively. It has a response. huge. I just mm -hmm. it. it has a huge thing. Mm -hmm. Responsibility and um, and they meet monthly. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I think part of the uh, idea is that technically this is under their purview now, but we are charging them to get back to us within a timeline on these specific topics. Um, in the form of a report so that we can really take another close look at this and see, okay, like here's this change and here's this cost associated with this change and this will be able to have an impact. I still do agree. I agree with Teresa on that. The, the physician, Dr. Lord, really made it clear that it wasn't that he was against prior authorization. He just wanted prior authorization like he does with other drugs that was quick that they believed, you know, and he said Medicaid was one of the best prior authorization across the board, right? That um, he felt they got back pretty quick, but they're not being treated the way that they should as physicians who work on this all the time. And that seems to be a pretty big issue for the field. Yeah. Tomorrow we'll hear. And then, and then I would say, um, just in case somebody was wondering about the second report, um, that is, I see that as, um, you know, whenever I was in committee and I was reading off of that sort of numbers that was saying, there have been 3000 prior authorizations for uh, Suboxone, you know what I mean? <clears throat> this is basically building off of that reporting process that already exists. It was put in place in 2019 for three years. It's now sunset, but really so that we're able to say, um, you know, why were a thousand of these prior authorizations approved? And why were the other 50 denied? And that data would already be encompassed within the report. It said, you know, denied because of a quantity limit or denied because we want them to choose this medication instead or denied because it was two eight milligram doses and we want it to be. So there's less room for interpretation. Uh, and this is something that Diva expressed um, support for taking up.
I feel we're at a place where we sort of need to think about how we do this, um, what our goals are. <clears throat> and um, yeah, and, and be prescriptive, but not being so prescriptive that they're confused. Um, and we're gonna hear some more. Um, now you, did you send this to them? What, this latest? Yeah. No, I just sent it to Julie, so it's okay. um, <clears throat> You've been working with them, sending them drafts. They're, uh, they're getting more nervous <laughs> every time we send a draft. But um, um, if this is something, or, you know, I mean, I guess, between now and nine o'clock, right? We're having um, nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. That between now and nine o'clock, at nine o'clock, we're having three or four people come testify. Um, and uh, um, three people testify. Um, two doctors and a nurse practitioner. So we will. Um, um, and then we have committee discussion around and finalization around what this is going to look like. Um, but I don't know whether we're in a place to go further tonight. Mm -hmm. Carl. I just ask a question of these two. That yeah. They might be able to clarify this for me. But um, when prior authorization is requested <clears throat> or there's a problem, like the doctor said this morning, and I asked the joint counselor, oops, what medication is it primarily? Is it the number one, you know, the critical mono? The, the common. In other words, somebody wants that. I'm just looking at, can the system be manipulated by, by the ultimate patient in a way? In other words, like that the patient says to the doctor, you know, I'm having side effects to, to the combination, and uh, can you do something for me? And so, and is that why these companies are saying, you know, we want there to be a prior authorization to possibly stop that from happening. You understand what I'm saying there? That yeah. the, the combination drugs are the ones that seem to cause some of these side effects, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the doctor, he takes the patient's word for it that they have nausea or some other, something else. And, and now that medication didn't work for the nausea. So eventually the doctor says, go on the mono. You, okay, mm -hmm. all right. And uh, I think that's, you know, I'm just trying to rationale what, why do they spend so much time on this prior authorization unless they're trying to stop something, you know? So anyway, just the just thought by throwing it out there and I don't know how to deal with it or find somebody that could tell us how much of that do they see. A manipulation of the system to some extent. Okay. Yeah, and I don't. I don't know if we will know that answer, but I think what we've heard from testimony is that it's it's twofold. One is that concern about diversion um, with the monobuprofen product, um, and that's why Suboxone is the preferred drug. And then the second is cost. So they have to have the prior authorization in place for the monobuprofen. Um, because the Suboxone, the, the combo, is the preferred drug where they get and more. And also the less rebates. expensive or less expensive? Not necessarily less okay. expensive, but you get the most rebates for it. Bigger bang for their buck on that one um, as compared to is. buprenorphine. Okay. All right. And it was just a thought. I, I don't yeah. know if you guys saw it, I'm just. Uh... It's a great question. And I think what we heard today is that like, folks are getting buprenorphine, the mono product on the street. And so then they're getting inducted through buying it on the street and then getting into healthcare to then be on stabilized treatment. So it's already out in the community as we did with our, our bill last year to help lower the, the threshold so that folks are able to get inducted by any way necessary so that they're able to retain on treatment. So it is it's a difficult balance. I totally see that. Um, but I'm not, I still hold that, that really distinct concern around overdose deaths and I'd rather see someone on treatment by any means necessary instead of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I understand. I, yeah. 
I actually found it promising um, that uh, was it Dr. Luconis said that he had a lot of people coming in to treatment for the first time, but with buprenorphine in their system. Mm -hmm. So it sort of suggests to me that somebody who may be um, receiving unprescribed buprenorphine is also open to treatment. <laughs> I mean, I guess I, the thing that's going to be hard for us is that we wanted something a whole lot different and we're not going to get that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we got to let go of that because um, otherwise we're going to waste our time. Um, and two, we got to keep focused on what it is we are looking for in a, um, in a report that will move us forward to um, identifying the, how to remove the barriers. And one, we we have heard that one barrier is pre-authorization. That's not a shared belief. So um, that's, that's a bit challenging. <clears throat> We've also heard that um, this mono, we like, you know, we, you know, I'm being shorthand. Um, Pre-authorization is, is helpful and supported because of issues maybe um, that you're bringing up, Carl, and others around um, who can do it. And it's a, risk, it's, it's a more risky um, product, perhaps, than some others for diversion. Um, but that, what did he say? You have to move mountains? Act of Congress. But an act of Congress. So how do we make it not an act of Congress? Um, or not we, because we're not going to do that. Um, how, you know, and so, and how do we say that in a way, I don't think we can put in the study, um, <laughs> please, <laughs> so that it doesn't take an act of Congress. But that's, I mean, right now, those are, um, and I, I, but I get a little, as some of the people were testifying this morning, they were, uh, um, I, I want to keep us focused on those things. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oops, yeah. Um, not on the bill we passed before, not on whose fault it is that we're where we are, or, um, you know, um, but that we see barriers. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> And, and, and we really don't quite understand prior authorization for Medicaid when it appears that there is not prior authorization for others. And that may be money. And that may be, and money- well, It was the other way around that there is no prior authorization. No, there, there, there's limited prior authorization for, uh, that we heard from the major insurers um, that are, the, the major private insurers that are in Vermont. Um, and there is prior authorization for, medic, for um, medic, Medicaid. And one, there used to be prior authorization for everything. <laughs> and two, um, there, you know, um, it's a way to support healthcare for the Medicaid population. It's a way to keep, you know, and so that that's one of those realities out there on, right now. So I feel like I feel like asking the drug utilization board to we just I feel like that's a good step um, mm -hmm. because we're asking the people who are experts in the field. This is part of their charge. I just was reading their charge. It's part of what they're okay, supposed good. to be doing. And we just need to make sure that we have the right questions, mm -hmm. you know, that the questions are being right. Uh, and that seems to be something that um, one, both divas on board with, um, and two, would give us additional information. <clears throat> and um, the, the thing that it feels like it doesn't go sort of that final step is, which is how, how would that information be used? You know, so if they make a recommendation that something should be done, is, is it incumbent upon DIVA to do it or they just like take it under advisement and decide, you know, because of the contracts they have for the utilization of certain drugs that they not going to do it or that's the part that seems that feels um, 
like a, a hanging chad, perhaps. <laughs> it's like it's hanging out there. Well, then, I mean, isn't, I mean, isn't part of it, um, they get information. They may or may, and we, and that information is also shared with us. Mm -hmm. They may or may not on their own make some changes. If they don't make changes, so I guess yeah. we invite them back next year. Yeah, we invite them. You're right. You yeah. know, and we, we invite them back in January, mm -hmm. you know, right. With, you know, and work with appropriations in terms of this is how, how much can we how much can we lose? Start how, how much, <laughs> you know, um, and do some of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, All right. I wish one of us had asked Dr. Gore what were the acts of Congress or whatever you refer to, okay, like an act of Congress to get approved. Maybe those things could be simplified. And uh, what I'm thinking, uh, what I'm anticipating would be is that his office probably gets called back and says, Did you prescribe uh, an anti, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. And those sorts of things. Right. And maybe that could be done on the front end when the guy writes the prescription. It'd be like an addendum to the prescription that says, we have checked this, we've checked this, we've checked that. You know? And so they don't have to call them. They, they have from the doctor the answers that they're probably bugging him about. I mean, that's just the impression I have. I mean, if you're a busy doctor and somebody calls from the pharmacy and says, did you prescribe a, a anti vomit medicine or something? And that's probably what he's thinking of is like Congress to get it through. <laughs> anyway, just the thought. No, I mean, I, I think you're right because I mean, I mean, part of what he said is he would like them to accept his medical opinion exactly. or his medical that, that um, you know. Right. He, he said rash, nausea. Migraine. That's what I'm, I'm sorry. Swelling. Yeah, migraine. Um, what was the other? There was swelling. Swelling. Um, face. That's right. Sweating. Um, those sort of things. So he just didn't want to put his patients through all that when he knew. The other thing I know that's not in this amendment that I wonder about that he brought up that really had an impact on me was the transportation issues and I know we have the van and I think that's great but what about the um the I can't think of the name of the organization that we do no we can't no, no, we're, we 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 need to stay just do this. stay in this lane yeah. we need to stay in this so, lane yeah, I did. And, and talking about the the pilots and whatever um, we can't I'm sorry there's no money we can't add another dime to this bill I did. Uh, I did want to suggest that. Um, did I? I'm sorry. Did I cut you off? Are you not going to say? No, no, no. I was just curious how much yeah. this bill was really costing at this point. I didn't think it was. Oh, the, the between pilots. the eight pilots. The pilots. Yeah, um, I think it's like under yeah under nine hundred thousand. But uh, uh, bring up going back to the transportation and the mobile MAT. Um, uh, Dr. Lord today kind of commented, you know, it can't just be the medication. Um, it needs to also be the casework. Our, our budget, um, the way that we budget it included a case manager. Is that something maybe we should specify in the language or is that just um, because the, the model that we based off of was, you know, included a case manager and a nurse practitioner. I, I think when we report it on the floor, you say that. Um, okay. um, I, I want to, yeah, yeah. Okay. And report it on the floor. Mm -hmm. Because then we'll get into well, what kind of therapist, and what is their background, and um, you know, and could, and have, and then could it be a case manager? And if it's a case manager, should it be a um, nurse case manager, or what about a social worker case manager, or what about yeah, yeah. just so? So for the record, that's included. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. No, I mean, it, I mean, it is sort of as he's talking about the things. Child care, transportation. It's like those are the other things that we've been working on. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I sometimes get frustrated when people say, you're not doing anything mm -hmm. about this problem. You know, those so and I'm aware that 
two of our, three of our members will need to be somewhere else in five minutes. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, um, I'm going to keep sort of going. We need to keep this as simple as we can. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing from the doctors tomorrow, or all, at least one of them. Um, the first one is, oh, the, first, the first doctor is um, one that Diva asked us to hear from. And so we're going to hear from, and then we have um, one from the com uh, Community Health Center, who I don't know, that's probably not a um, spoke. Maybe it is, I don't know. Um, and then um, some, um, a nurse practitioner from the Safe Recovery Program. Uh, so we will, we will hear, I think that'll be helpful three diverse people. Hopefully, um, it would be really great if someone from DIVA could come um, so we could ask them questions and so they could provide us some feedback. For the record, it is a smoke. Oh, good. Yes. Okay, good. So we all have that. Um, so thank you all. And this is, you know, um, this is going to be one of those bills that we will do the best we can. And then we will... Um, um, rely on the good work of the Senate, perhaps with our help, um, to if we need to, if you know, for any kind of massaging and for other people to come and testify and do something different with it. Um, but thank you all. Um, and tomorrow, uh, bring, um, um, bring our good moods <laughs> because at least our caucus said we were going to be here late. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, to realize that, and if you have not, um, for those of you who don't always go home, make sure you made your reservations. Okay. This ends. This is this is Mother Anne speaking, and now that's done. <laughs> and this ends the um, uh, tonight tonight's um, meeting. And on a good note, we did a great job today and a great presentation, a little history lesson yeah. on the floor um, that was helpful. Um,